Good afternoon. This is Kyle Welch with RCR Wireless News. I want to thank everyone for attending Using Distance to PIM Technology to Speed Site Repairs, presented by Ann Ritsu. Our presenter today is Tom Bell, Senior Product Manager at Ann Ritsu. Just a reminder to everyone that within 24 hours of this webinar, we will provide you with a link to the on-demand version of today's webinar. During the webinar, we encourage you to submit questions via the control panel, which will be answered at the end of the presentation. With that being said, I'd like to now turn over the presentation to Tom Bell. All right, thanks, Kyle. Appreciate that. All right, so as you said, this is using distance to PIM technology to speed site repairs. Uh, agenda of, of what I, I plan to talk about first is, as with any presentation on pathfinder modulation, I have to throw in a few slides to explain what is PIM. Um, and then from there, go into detail of the traditional methods for, for field testing to find and eliminate PIM. Introduce then distance to PIM technology, talk about the resolution and the accuracy that's available with this technology. Go back also and explain the methods that are used when using DTP to find and eliminate PIM. And then at the end, I've got a, a couple of examples, a rooftop site, radiating coax cable example, and indoor DAS examples just to show how the technology is used in the field. So starting off with what is passive intermodulation, the simplest definition is that PIM is interference. It's new frequencies that are generated by the transmit signals of the cell site when they encounter nonlinear junctions in the RF path. So if you look at the, the, the picture above, the two red lines represent what the transmit signals would look like at a cell site, and the blue lines represent the intermodulation products that would be created when those transmit signals mix at nonlinear junctions. The problem we're trying to fix is that if the blue lines or if the intermodulation products fall in the operator's uplink band, it can elevate the noise floor, causing higher drop calls, higher access failure rates, and slower data rates. So what at a cell site might be the cause of a nonlinear junction? Well, the most common are metal-to-metal -metal contacts or loose metal-to-metal -metal contacts. This is caused by poorly terminated RF connectors, flakes of metal inside the connectors, loose RF connections that just the connector was not tightened correctly, as well as uh, metal flashing on rooftops, screws, things that are loose inside the antenna like rivets. It can also be caused by materials that are inherently nonlinear, things like nickel and steel and ferrite. So, as a, as a, to reiterate, the purpose of PIM testing is to find and eliminate these nonlinear junctions. That's the whole reason we're doing this test. And a PIM test analyzer is a specialized piece of equipment that helps us find the location of these PIM sources and identifies the magnitude of the PIM that's being generated in a system. The way that a PIM analyzer works is that we generate two frequencies, two test tones at high power, we combine them together and send them out into the system under test. If there are nonlinearities in the system, the two signals will mix and create the intermodulation products. The IM products will not only continue in the same direction as the test signals, <clears throat> but they'll also return back in the direction of the test instrument. And so inside the test instrument, the, the first component that you see is a duplexing filter. And this duplexer separates the transmit signals from the received signals, the received signals in this case being the IM products. The IM products then go through additional filtering, amplification, and ultimately go to receiver to record the, the magnitude of the PIM that's being generated. What the user sees, however, is an interface that's like what's shown on the right, which is showing in the yellow trace the magnitude of the, of the intermodulation product that's being generated versus time. And as you can see here, in this particular case, the inter the, 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 there's a pass-fail limit here, which is the green line, and we're starting off with the PIM below the pass-fail limit, so it's passing. However, when I tap on RF connections that have uh, a loose connection or metal flakes or something like that, the PIM will spike. So the requirement for PIM testing is 
that it not only pass in a static sense or when I'm not tapping on it, but also in a dynamic sense. So in other words, when I'm tapping on the RF connection, I should also <clears throat> maintain a stable magnitude of PIM that should stay below the limit line. So the question is, all right, that's all well and good, but what happens when the PIM level is above the pass-fail line when I first start the test? How do I find and eliminate those PIM problems? Well, the traditional approach is kind of a divide and conquer approach where I use a low PIM termination, which is basically a long length of coax um, that's designed to attenuate the, the signals without generating PIM. I'll insert that in the system at key locations and then look for PIM between the test instrument and that low PIM termination and use the tap method to try to tap on the connections to try to find where the location of the PIM is. So that's the traditional method for isolating the system and figuring out where is the source of intermodulation. Better. Okay, so this works fairly well if, the, if for things like loose RF connections, metal flakes, things like that. However, the tapping method is not effective if you're dealing with nonlinear materials or if you were dealing with situations where you have, might, might have dissimilar metal junctions, contamination inside of components, or if the PIM is not, if the PIM source is not where you're tapping, tapping is not going to do any good. So things like external PIM sources, where the PIM source is beyond the antenna, or if the PIM source happens to be in the middle of a cable run, or in radiating coax applications. So the tapping method is, is good for a large number of PIM sources, but it's just not effective for many others. Believe it or not, this is a simplified diagram showing what the process looks like traditionally for PIM remediation. Now, notice that you have a starting point. You go into the static test, meaning that you just turn the instrument on and look at what the magnitude is. If it's passing at that point, great. You immediately now go into the dynamic testing of tapping the connections. If everything passes, you're done. So in the ideal world, this top line is all that we're dealing with with a, with a PIM test. In the real world, however, this is often not the case. Often you attach your you attach the equipment to the system and start testing and immediately it's it's failing and you're trying to now figure out where is the source sorry guys <clears throat> where is the source of the passive intermodulation. Usually what we do is install the low PIM load at the antenna location. That means we've now separated the problem into is it the feed system or is it the antenna or something radiated by the antenna. If we then test and it's passing with the, with the termination attached to the feed system, we know the feed system is probably good, but the problem is now somewhere either the antenna or external to the antenna. And by doing things like taking the antenna down and testing it individually, or if I'm on a rooftop, I can tilt the antenna towards the sky. There's things I can do to help determine, gain more information to determine whether or not it's the antenna or something external to the antenna. If I tilt the antenna to the sky and it's passing and I then put it back in its normal location and it's failing, it means that there's a, probably a good indication that I have an external PIM fault. However, the problem is that the only data that I have to present back to my customer is a failing result. And I can present this, this process of here was this test, here was this test, here's another test, and present that, but all you end up with is a logical conclusion. You don't end up with definitive data showing that the, the PIM source is actually external to the antenna. So the challenges or problems with this process, the traditional process, is it's a pretty complex task. It takes a lot of reasoning and skill to be able to take these clues that the a test instrument is giving you and to process that information into something that's meaningful to go find and fix. So it does require a lot of skill. It also means that I'm going to have to install this PIM termination at locations in the system. And if the first step is to install the termination at the antenna, it means that step one is I need to climb the tower. The next thing is I'm going to necessarily have to remove the weatherproofing in order to access that connector. And at the end, when I'm putting it back together, you know, I may have an opportunity to either improperly deploy the weatherproofing or I might actually damage connections. 
Um, also, the act of moving and repositioning antennas to verify external PIM means that, A, there's labor associated with that, but also it means that at the end, I'm going to have to spend time and effort resetting the, the tilt as well as the azimuth bearing of that antenna to get it back to the design location. So, and also then and finally with external PIM, I don't have conclusive data showing that the PIM is external. I have a series of logical steps that indicate that it's external, but I really just don't have information that I can give back to my customer that says, here is where the problem is. It's not in the feed system. It's not the antenna. It is some other location. So a better method is to use distance to PIM technology. In this case, we run an analysis and it tells you where the PIM is. It then, the process here is now to just is to fix the largest and repeat until you've eliminated the PIM sources that are the, the offenders. Then go back to your the standard process of, uh, of doing the static PIM test followed by a dynamic test. So what's good about this approach is that it works for all PIM sources, whether the PIM source is inside the antenna or beyond the antenna, um, the system it's, it's part of the RF path, and so the test instrument really doesn't care where the location is. It will still give you the distance to identify its location. It works for loose mechanical things as well as material things. So it really doesn't dep depend on um, how the PIM source responds to dynamic input to determine whether or not it can see it or not. And finally, it honestly just requires a lot less skill. It's a lot easier to run the test and have the system tell you here is where the problem is. Um, and then ultimately the information that the test provides is a lot higher quality. It provides you data on what to do next as opposed to clues to tell you what the next step is. The screen on the left is the, is the distance to PIM screen for, from the Enritsu test equipment. Um, in the testing mode, PIM versus time is the standard test that you're going to use for the static PIM testing and dynamic PIM testing. You know, one button below is the distance to PIM button. So just press the one button, it'll change into a distance to PIM measurement type and perform the test. So how does distance to PIM work? Well, it's, it's really the same math that's been deployed by Enritu since 1997 for distance to fault. So basically we're starting with frequency domain data. We take a swept measurement. We use an inverse Fourier, fast Fourier transform to convert it to time domain, and by knowing the velocity factor of the medium that you're transmitting through, you can calculate the distance to, in the case above, it's the, it's the, the reflection sources, but for PIM, it would be the PIM sources. Um, I reference everyone to the application note that's available on the Enritsu website. Um, it's a good discussion of the, of the technology and the math that's used for, for distance to distance to fall, and it applies directly to distance to PIM as well. In that same application note, there's a, there's a nice chart which shows the, the impact of swept frequency bandwidth on both the maximum range of the test as well as the resolution. Now, when I speak of resolution, what I'm talking about is the ability to uniquely identify two faults that are close their space closely together. And so if you look at this, this chart from the distance to fault um, uh, application note, notice it starts at a, at a frequency sweep of 50 megahertz and goes up to 550. And what it's showing here is that as I get more and more available swept frequency data, I can get much, much tighter resolution. In other words, I can see PIM sources that are much closer together individually with a wide amount of swept frequency data. However, the trade-off here is, is that the maximum range that I can analyze becomes less and less. I've shaded this section yellow here because the interesting thing about distance to PIM is that this is the regime that we're working in. We don't have available to us a wide amount of spectrum to work with. The reason being that diplexer that's on the front end of our test instrument, which is absolutely necessary to separate the transmit signals from the, the low magnitude received signals, is a frequency limiting component. It, lim it limits how much swept bandwidth we can get on the transmit side, as well as limits the amount of received bandwidth we have available to analyze. So I once again refer you back to the application note. The, the, the calculations are all here showing 
you know, the impact of, of when I change the, the, the swept frequency, what the impact is on resolution as well as uh, maximum distance in meters. So here is the, um, a summary by frequency band of what the swept available bandwidth is for each of the different models. And this is, this is, uh, this, you notice the, the, the maximum one here is just over 55 megahertz. So we're dealing with a very small amount of swept frequency bandwidth to, to begin with. And what I did is I highlighted the GSM 900 over here to show the example of why is it 25 megahertz? What's that limitation? And so above I'm showing the, the, the license spectrum band for the extended GSM system. The, tr the transmit from the base, the base station, station is... is wow. Wow. How's that? Very good, thanks. So the, the, the transmit from the base station is from 925 to 960 megahertz, and the base station is receiving between 880 and 915. Now that's the entire license spectrum in this case. With our PIM test equipment, we're designed to be able to transmit within the transmit range, and we're designed to be able to receive within the receive range. So the starting point to, to create a swept IM product is to choose frequencies that are close enough together to generate the IM product which occurs at the very top end of the, of the license uh, receive band. We then sweep the transmit frequency to the right until we get to the maximum allowed frequency within that range. And that determines what the far end is of how far you can, the farthest away frequency you can sweep. So in the case of the GSM 900, as you can see in this example, the maximum amount of frequency bandwidth we have available is from the start at 915 to 890, which is the farthest we can create with two transmit tones in the transmit band, resulting in the 25 megahertz. So that's how the calculation is done to determine each of these different uh, swept bandwidths. And notice here that some of these are better than others. So for instance, the, the, the 1800 megahertz is the best we have with a 2.4 meter resolution. And some of these are not quite as good. So if I go up to, to uh, 700 megahertz, just inherently because of the limitations of the frequency, we're dealing with a resolution of 7.2 meters. So one thing that, that Enrichu has done to improve this is that we have done some advanced uh, algorithms that allow us to see PIM sources closer together or to enhance the resolution compared to what I can get from a standard uh, fast Fourier transform. And the enhanced resolution techniques typically improve the resolution by at least a factor of two. So in this sample shown here, I have a, a PIM test instrument test up to a 16 meter uh, line with a PIM, test, a PIM source at 16 meters and a PIM source at 18 meters. Obviously the separation is two meters, which is less than the standard resolution of the system. And you can see from the yellow line, which is displaying the standard resolution, it, it is confused. It sees that there's two PIM sources, but it's giving me a number, which is at 16.7 meters, which is between the two. However, with the enhanced resolution algorithms, it's able to individually pick out that there are two PIM faults and give me an answer telling me what the location is. And you can see here, in this particular case, we know that they are at 16 meters and 18 meters, and it predicted these actual numbers, which you know, within 0.3 meters on one and 0.6 meters on the other, it did a pretty reasonable job of predicting the location of those PIM faults. We get often asked, well, what's the accuracy of the system? And there's a big difference between instrument accuracy and measurement accuracy. Uh, in the field, that's what you see. That's measurement accuracy. The instrument itself is, is very repeatable and very accurate, but there are a lot of things that, that are impacted impacted by the system you're testing as well as your selection of variables that are going to impact what you see on the instrument uh, from an accuracy standpoint. So some of those variables that, that are going to impact the accuracy are first and foremost the propagation velocity. If I choose an incorrect value, it will directly change the scaling on the screen um, and give you a different answer. So if I look at the example on the left-hand side here, this is the exact same system measured and the only thing that was changed was on the first one the velocity factor was entered as 0.8 and the second one the velocity factor was entered as 0.88 so it was a hundred foot change with a 10% change in velocity factor 
no surprise, the distance that it reported is off by 10%. So you as a user have a direct impact on the, the, the absolute accuracy of the number that's reported by your selection of the propagation velocity. Now that becomes a little bit more complicated also because most systems are, are not just one piece of cable of one velocity factor. You usually have jumpers, you have a long section of feed, you have more jumpers. Um, and so the electrical, the propagation velocity is, a, is you're going to get close, but you're, you're very rarely going to get the exact number. So you have to live with some expectation of the absolute value that the, of the accuracy is going to vary based on, on uh, propagation velocity changes within the system. As the signals become weaker and weaker, we have uh, it impacts the the the, res the accuracy. Um, that resolution confusion I talked about before. That as a user, if you received an answer of 16.7 and it was actually at 15 and or actually at uh, 16 and 18, uh, you know, to you, 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 the resolution confusion tends to make you think you're getting the wrong answer. Then there are also electrically long devices like tower mount amplifiers and filters that the physical length of the object is very different than the electrical length of the object. And so from a perceived accuracy standpoint, if you're transmitting through those types of devices, the test still works. However, um, you may have many meters difference between the physical length of the system and the electrical length of the system. And then finally, large PIM sources close to the test instrument have an end tendency to hide smaller PIM sources that are farther away from the instrument. So that's why it's important to do um, the, the iterative process of find the largest PIM source, eliminate it, repeat, and keep going until you've dropped the PIM level down to an acceptable level. This is, this is some data that I think is a good indication of instrument accuracy because it's really an ideal condition. We have a closed system where we um, inserted a PIM source at different distances away from each of the different uh, test instruments and measured the, uh, the, the value that the PIM instrument predicted for the location of the PIM source and compared that to what the actual was. And so this is a, a summary of the errors that were measured relative to each of the different frequency bands that were tested. And so summing all of this, you see that the overall, the, the, the error in average was off by 0.21 meters, which is 8.3 inches, which is, is very, very good. So, so from an instrument accuracy standpoint, um, I think the, the test is quite capable for being able to identify individual PEM sources. So taking that capability, how would I use this in the field? So, uh, you know, I could have drawn this chart a lot simpler, but I intentionally added some more steps here. Um, and let's just go through it real quickly. So if you notice, the top line is exactly the same as the previous. I start my test. I perform a static PIM test, which means that I just don't do anything. I turn it on and look at what the magnitude is. If it's passing, I immediately go on to my dynamic PIM testing, and then I save my results. And so in the world where you have a starting PIM value that is passing, you never have to use distance to PIM analysis. There's really no need to. However, if I start the test and it's failing, now I go into distance to PIM, and I use the information to tell me what to do next. So if the largest PIM source is obviously in the feed system, I repair it. If I get to the point where I'm not really sure, it looks like it might be at the antenna location, it might be beyond, this is where I start using um, a PIM marker. And a PIM marker is just any object that generates PIM. A simple one is a bag of steel wool. In some, in some languages, it translates better as steel cotton. But steel wool is something you can buy at the hardware store, and if you tape it to an antenna surface, it's a wonderful PIM source. It's basically a wound ball of fine metal fibers that are lightly touching each other that generates mass quantities of PIM. Um, I personally put them inside of a plastic bag before I put it onto the antenna so I don't have the metal fibers uh, falling around. But it works great. It's inexpensive, inexpensive and simple. And all, all I, I do, do is use uh, uh, painter's tape and tape it to the radome and I have a wonderful marker that electrically tells me the exact distance between my test instrument and that antenna radome. So now I've inserted, inserted a PIM marker 
and I've never had to break the coax at all. Then I run, I, I store that marker into memory, and so on the screen, if you notice over here, there's a red trace and a white trace. The red trace is storing of the, of the uh, PEM marker trace into memory. I then remove the PEM marker, run it again, and look at the result. If the PIM marker, if the actual PIM of the system is farther away than the marker, I know definitively. The answer is, well, the PIM is in front of the antenna, and in this particular case, it's uh, 38 feet, it looks like, in front of the antenna. I now have data I can give back to my customer that says, look, we ran the marker, here's the PIM source, it's in front of the antenna, it's not our antenna system, it's not the feed system, it's, there's something else that needs to be repaired. So it gives you definitive data that's given to your customer. If I remove the, the PIM marker and the PIM had been it'd be closer to the instrument, well now I know that I have things to work on inside the system. If I remove the PIM marker and the PIM is at the exact same location, I know it's the antenna. So the difference here between, between the standard method and the distance to PIM method is that we're getting data we can use and immediately go work on the locations of the system as opposed to clues that get us closer. So to restate the benefits, um, obviously it's much less complex. It takes a lot less skill that the instrument does the thinking for you and gives you an answer and says, go look here. Here's where the problem is. So um, just, just much easier. Instead of giving clues, as I said here, it's giving me data. It's giving me something definitive to work with. Um, also, I can go to a test and, and go to a site and perform a test, and I know whether a tower climb is, is required within seconds. So if the PIM problem is inside the shelter and it's three meters away, I may be able to fix this site without ever having to pull a tower crew onto the site. Also, I only remove weatherproofing when it's necessary. If the, if the line is not showing a PIM problem at a location, there's no reason to break that connection to install a, a PIM termination in order to perform the test. Also, I don't need to reposition antennas to verify external PIM. Um, the PIM marker is done external to the antenna. It does not require me to reposition. Um, and once again, it does give me conclusive data that I can present back to my customer showing the location of these PIM faults. So here we, here we go with some examples. So this is, this is a, a rooftop site. Um, distance to PIM was run on both the slant plus 45 polarization port and the minus 45 polarization port on the same antenna. So this is the same antenna is viewing the same environment, but we're looking at it from, uh, from just two different polarization senses. If you notice on the minus 45 degree port, it's a very low PIM. It's passing. It's got a, it's a in this case, a minus 104 dBm is what the, PIM, the maximum distance to PIM is reporting. However, when I test the plus 45 degree port, I'm seeing something close to the antenna. I'm also seeing something uh, 4.3 meters or 14 feet in front of the antenna, and it's a very high magnitude. So in this case, um, we believe that it was the metal flashing, on, that the antennas are hidden in this uh, roof feature behind these false panels, and it's radiating the rooftop in front. And I find this very interesting that that uh, one polarization is highly impacted by the external PIM source and the opposite polarization is not. So in some cases, if I happen to only be transmitting on one polarization, I could turn, put my transmitters on the, uh, the minus 45 degree port and do receive only on the plus 45 and, and quote, fix the site or at least fix the interference problem simply by swapping my transmit to the other, other uh, port. Second example is uh, radiating cable. What radiating cable is, is it's basically a coaxial cable that's used often in, in uh, subway and tunnel applications. And it's also called leaky coax because there are holes that are machined in the side of the coax that create a precise aperture. And as the signal is propagating down the coax, it leaks a little bit of energy. Likewise, is if you or a user are moving along the length of the coax, your energy couples into the coax at different lengths, depending on which uh, which of the apertures are, are coupling in. So that's that's what uh, leaky coax or, or radiating cable is. And so as an experiment to say, how effective is distance to PIM in, in 
finding external PIM sources, um, you know, near uh, leaky coax, we set up an experiment where we had 22 meters of leaky coax inside of a inside of a warehouse. We had a low PIM termination on the end, um, and then we used once again steel wool as our external PIM source, and we placed it at different locations along the length of the of the radiating cable to the derm to determine the ability of the system to be able to identify these external PIM faults. And so, as you see here, um, we first determined a mark on the cable. And luckily, the cable has uh, markings every one meter printed on it by the manufacturer. So the first thing we did was we placed uh, the, the PIM source at, or the steel wool, at this P1 location and measured that that was 4.47 meters away. Then we would then move the PIM source relative to that first location. And that gives us two things. One, it, we, we moved it to a location, and we know what the theoretical distance should be based on the six meters of movement and the electrical length from the test instrument to the P1 point. And as you can see here, in theory, it was 10.47 meters. The distance to PIM returned a measurement of 10.36 meters, a delta of, of you know, 0.11 meters. So very, very accurate identification of the external PIM source. So here we go again. We now have moved it to a distance theoretical distance of 22.47, distance to PIM rec uh, estimated 22.64, a distance of 0.17. And then just to show that it can see multiple PIM sources, we now put the one back at 10.47, left the one in place at 22.47, and now you can see it's, it's still able to see both of those PIM sources and report them. And interestingly enough, with the same level of accuracy on each of the two measurements. Now, it's not really obvious, but Previously, the magnitude of this first one was approximately the same as the other one. But just the act of removing this steel wool and placing it back slightly differently had a big difference in the, on how much energy was actually coupling into that steel wool. So radiating cable, um, it's interesting that a very close distance around the cable is where your impact is. And if you get very far away from it, meaning if I get on the order of uh, less than half a meter or even even 200 centimeters away from the cable, um, the external PEM sources become less of a factor. Uh, the last example I have is uh, at an indoor DAS. This was one where we actually came in to give a demonstration of the system, and the customer uh, had recently installed a DAS in their system or in their building and said, would you like to either give your PowerPoint presentation or um, or come play with our DAS, and of course we chose to test the DAS. So on the left-hand side is the picture, is a photograph of, of what we were testing, and on the right-hand side is a schematic showing that in this particular case, multiple, multiple frequency band uh, were combined together in a frequency, in a filter combiner, which then fed into a dividing network to split it out into the individual branches of this particular DAS. So when we first tested, we were using the 1800 megahertz test set we brought with us. We tested the full system. And interestingly, the system was failing. Um, and going back to this previous step, the first thing we did was just go touch each of these connections. And we found that, that almost none of them had been torqued. And so the first step we did before doing anything was just go and retorque the connections. And it made a big difference in the PIM level just by doing that first step. So this next step with distance to PIM is after we had torqued the connections, we were now looking for where's the next biggest PIM problem. And we can see that we know it's a measurement of 58.6 meters away from the point where we're testing right here. But that could be anywhere within the system. So we further used distance to PIM to divide the, the problem. So we went to the first branch and tested here and noticed that the worst case value was less than neg 97 dBm. So we know that this offending problem, which was at a magnitude of you know, less than minus uh, 90 dBm, is not on. OK, so Perfect. the next thing we did okay. was went to the next branch and tested it. And once again, we could see PIM out in the system, but the magnitude is at a level where we know that's not the offending location. So the next thing we did was then go to S, the branch S6, and here we go. Now we have found the branch that has the, the problems associated with this system. Now, interestingly, when we tested, we could see the PIM sources out in the system, but we also saw that right at the end of our test lead, something was happening. There was a, not a failing level, but there was a PIM response coming from right at the end of the cable. 
So what we did is we took apart the, the connector for the feed system, brushed out some metal flakes, retorked it, and we're able to eliminate that pen problem um, you know, right there at that input. Now, unfortunately, this was, once again, it was a sales call and it was a demonstration of the equipment, so we really didn't have time to go debug what were the individual problems out on branch six. But what we did do is we did install a low PIM termination here to simulate, well, if we did go and fix those PIM problems that were at 48 meters and 90 meters, what would be the impact that we could gain on system performance? And we show here that by isolating that branch with the low PIM load, we had fixed the PIM problems in the system. The largest magnitude is now out here at less than minus 110 dBm. So that kind of gives us an idea of, of the, the potential we could gain by by going and doing further work on that branch. But once again, going back to the, to the test, distance to PIM is an analysis tool. It is not the final pass-fail tool that you use as a test. PIM versus time under dynamic testing is the pass-fail test. And just overlaying in line sweep tools the measurements that we received, the top line shows what the PIM level was before we started. After just making the minimal repairs we made with just tightening connections, uh, we were able to drop it down uh, more than 20 dB, and then the blue line says, look, you can get an additional 12 dB if you go and perform the additional repairs on, on branch S6. So that, that's the summary of the, of, that's the end of the presentation. So just summary, um, you know, once again, distance to PIM is not a replacement for dynamic PIM testing. It's a tool. It's an excellent analysis tool to get you to the point where you're performing the dynamic PIM testing much sooner. It does have limitations, both in resolution and measurement accuracy, but I think, I think you've seen from the examples I provided here that, that it's still very, very good at getting you into the, the right location for, for uh, identifying where the problems are. Um, it's effective not only for things inside the feed system, but it's also effective for finding PIM sources beyond the antenna system. It eliminates the guesswork simplifies the process, and provides high-quality information back to the user, whether you're learning it's the top of the tower or the bottom of the tower, whether the PIM is internal or external, or just where do I start in order to find the PIM. So ultimately, all of this means that distance to PIM technology will lead to faster site repairs, which ultimately means lower cost. All right, so that's it. I'm happy to take uh, Questions, Kyle, are you going to jump in? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have a lot of questions to get to, Tom. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, the first question we have, does distance to PIM come standard with Enritsu PIM test equipment? Yes. As I showed on the one slide, it's just a, it's a different measurement mode that is built into the equipment that we provide. So, yes, it does, does come standard. Okay. The second question why can't I use distance default to identify the location of PIM faults? <laughs> um, this, this is a very, very common mis, uh, misconception. You know, distance default is an excellent tool for identifying the location of impedance mismatches in the system. And starting in 1997, when that was first made available from Enritsu, um, it was uh, a great tool to help you find and eliminate uh, sources of reflection in the system. And I think as an industry, um, everybody learned that that was the quality metric used to measure infrastructure, was that by measuring return loss and by measuring distance to fault, um, you, could, you, could, you were verifying that you had high quality infrastructure. Um, however, return loss or impedance mismatches are really not the same thing as PIM. PIM is caused by loose connections that are excited by um, high-powered uh, uh, signals, whereas impedance mismatches are causing reflections. So the site master does a wonderful job of, of telling you where the reflections are. It's important to fix those to make sure that we are getting the energy out of the system. But it is not going to be an effective tool for identifying PIM sources. One, it's because it's transmitting a single frequency. Two, because it's transmitting that single frequency at low power. It's just not a tool that's designed to, to stimulate a, a PIM source. The next question we have is, as a contractor, if I find there is an external, external PIM source, what should I do about it? 
Um, you know, honestly, this is a, this is a question that you should discuss with your with your customer before you ever start testing, because ultimately your customer needs to tell you what to do in this situation. And different customers have different requirements. So, um, you know, normally what I would say to someone who's asking this question is is uh, provide as much data as possible to help your customer understand that you're just not trying to get out of work. You're actually trying to help them identify the location. So, so um, you know, providing them photographs from the view of the antenna to show what you think might be the problem, providing distance to PIM uh, overlay traces showing here is the marker at the antenna, I removed the, the marker, here's where the PIM source is, here's the distance. So provide as much data as possible, but ultimately have this discussion with your customer before you ever start testing. Okay. The next question we had come in is, if PIM is a dynamic test, how can a distance to PIM be effective unless there is someone there to tap, wiggle, or shake? Um, well, distance to PIM does not require tapping, wiggling, and shaking to find the static PIM sources. So um, and let, let's clarify. Distance to PIM is used when you connect to the system and you have a static failure. So, so this tool is used when there is a static failure and you're trying to quickly eliminate the static failure. Um, once you get it to the point where it's, it's passing from a static standpoint, you're not using distance to PIM. You're now using the dynamic test to verify that it's going to stay passing um, when impacted. Okay. Um, next question we had come in. Um, we have seen some potential suppliers where the plenum rated cable had nicks or cuts on the braiding. The supplier has indicated they are within spec. How can you truly test this once you remove the connect? Um, um, I guess I'm not 100% sure what's in, what the question is, but at the end of the day, the system has to pass. No. We there? Yep. Okay. So, at the end of the day, the system has to pass, and so whether it's within specification or not, you're going to find that out pretty quickly when you get in the field and perform the test. So, if there's a nick or an abrasion that does not cause PIM, then you know, then it's then it's uh, it's, it's going to come down to whatever the, the the customer specifications are for that particular criteria. If the if the nick or or the, the, the mechanical damage, if you will, to the braiding is causing PIM, then it's causing PIM. Okay. The next question is: We test our products in a stationary position versus moving the product around until a good PIM measurement is found. Is this not the best method to test PIM? Can, can you repeat that one again? Sure. Um, so basically, they test their um, their products in a stationary position versus moving the product around until a good PIM measurement is found. Is this not the best method to test PIM? Um, well, I'm still a little confused by the by the question, but you know, at the end of the day, um, the uh, um, the site has to pass in the configuration that was a, that was designed by the RF designer. So whether it's an indoor system and the antenna is placed at location A, B, C, the system has to work at the design location. If it's an outdoor site, that means that the system has to work with the antenna pointed in the direction that it's going to be used in actual use. So you have to test it in the final resting position. Now, I am aware that there are some um, uh, many, uh, you, um, operators that are for indoor systems are specifying a pretest of antenna locations to verify that inherently the location is good before you come up with the design look the final design placement. And I, I think that's a great way to do this, that you look for external PIM sources and mitigate them before you invest the time and the effort in doing the final uh, installation. So I don't I'm not sure if that answers the question or not, but Okay. Um, the next one is, will DTP really help with troubleshooting a PIM issue that exists between the antenna and the pigtail? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the, you know, let's, let's, the, the antenna being the antenna, the pigtail being the, the, the jumper that's the 
between the feed line and the antenna. Uh, yeah, no, so a lot of times what I'm seeing today is instead of having um, systems that are just riddled with PEM sources, you usually end up with now the construction quality being pretty good, the antennas being good, the cables being good, and usually it's one defect or maybe two defects that you're looking for and isolating. And that's just a product of the, the, the industry has gotten a lot better. And so if I connect to the system and I can tell the difference between whether that PEM source is, is at the antenna or whether it's at the, the feeder end of the antenna. So absolutely. So knowing when I, when I, get, when I do the measurement, which end of, the, of, the, of the, the jumper I need to be working on is much better information than starting off with, well, it's up there somewhere. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, will the DTF feature give approximate distance of an external PIM source? Uh, well, DTP, but yes, absolutely. Um, the, um, the DTF feature. Well, we don't we don't have DTF built into the PIM master. We have DTP. So, uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Is if if I use DTF, will it tell me if something's external? Um, to, you know, <laughs> to my experience, no. If if you know, a great example is that if I have screening material in front of an antenna, um, I can place the screening material in front of an antenna to the point where it's giving me terrible reflection. However, from a PIM perspective, I may not see any PIM being caused by that screening material. Likewise, I could have a, a, a sheet of metal that's placed, you know, one meter in front of an antenna that has absolutely no reflections, no measurable reflections coming back into the system in, in an impedance mismatch standpoint. However, I can have horrible PIM generated if that piece of metal happens to be rusty or, or loosely contacting something else. So once again, two very, very different measurements, um, and you cannot use distance to faults to indicate distance to PIM, and you can't use um, um, just the, the return loss measurement as an indication of a PIM measurement. Okay, uh, next question is, where do you find the velocity factors? Um, in, inside the, the instrument, we have a lookup table that if you just read the cable that you're using, um, and traditionally what's done is whatever the longest cable in a run is, use the velocity factor for that cable. And so um, in the instrument, we have a lookup table that you select the, the cable type you're using, and it will automatically populate the velocity factor. And if you don't, if it happens to be one that we don't have, um, you need to call that particular manufacturer or look at their data sheet. Okay. Um, also, is there a length limit to the PIM testing device? Uh, yes, there is. There is limitation based on the swept frequency bandwidth. Um, we have two. You know, that, that's dependent on the number of points you select. Um, we have two different selections. I typically run it at the lowest number because it means that it's the fastest uh, measurement speed. And with 128 measurement points in a typical system. Um, you know, it's on the order of 400 meters of measurement length is what my, what my max alias free range is. If I need to extend that, I choose the higher uh, number of data points, and then I can extend the range further. Uh, another question, how would you insulate a suspected PIM issue between an antenna and the antenna's pigtail or cable? Yeah, um, okay, so in that case, once again, the steps that I would do is I would measure the system. It's failing. I would put the steel wool on the antenna, store that in the memory, remove the steel wool, and now I have the location of the, of the offending PIM problem. Generally speaking, it's going to be in one of two places. If, it, if we know it's the pigtail, it's going to be at, the, it's going to be at one of the connectors. And if the, the uh, if, the, if you get to that point, you, you've, you've got it down to, I know it's the antenna or I know it's this, this, uh, the pigtail, then at that point, you're going to have to go and uh, uh, disconnect and, and install the load to do the further isolation of the problem, um, or you may go up and go back into PIM versus time mode and do dynamic testing. So, you know, don't, don't give up on the dynamic PIM testing tool. It's still a tool you have in your arsenal. Um, the distance to PIM gets you to the location much faster to be able to start focusing your effort. 
Okay. Um, another question, a couple that we've had have dealt with, if Enritsu offers any sort of um, additional PIM training or any additional information about the dynamic PIM testing? The dynamic PIM testing? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and Ritsu offers uh, certification classes, and part of that training is to go through and not only learn how to operate the instrument, but there also are, are cable assemblies with, uh, with different uh, PIM sources presented to the student, and uh, that's where we provide the training. It's not something that you are going to just read the manual and go do it. This is something that I highly recommend getting certified training. Uh, the training classes offered by Enritsu, I think, are basically a full-day class. You spend you know, half the day learning uh, the theory to make sure you're, cl you're clear on what the theory is, and then the second half of the day is, is hands-on practice of actually using the instrument to, to uh, find and eliminate PIM sources. Okay, uh, we have time for about two more questions. Uh, the first one is, if I have isolated an antenna as the issue, how can I tell if it's the antenna or reflection, as in your previous example? Um, okay, so if, I've, if, you've, if you've determined that you think the antenna is the problem, and let's, let's go back through the process. You've used distance to PIM, you've, you've put the, the PIM source on the antenna, stored it, you remove the PIM source, or the, the PIM marker, and it's indicating it's an antenna. In that case, um, you're going to need to now get that antenna to the point where you can test it individually. You're probably going to have to replace it is, is, the, is, the, is the bottom line. When testing antennas individually, you're going to put them on the ground on uh, sawhorses or something non-metallic pointing towards the clear sky, and then at that point you can individually measure the antenna again for, for pass-fail criteria. Um, and, and I'm, I'm going to reiterate here, distance to PIM is a tool to help you find static PIM problems. It's not the pass-fail test. You will still always use a PIM versus time test um, as your pass-fail criteria. So this just gets you to the point of knowing, aha, the location of the problem is the antenna. Now you're going to go back and, and do what you would normally do to, to mitigate that problem. Okay, um, another question that a couple people have been asking is, can you quickly clarify the difference between distance to PIM and distance to fault? Uh, sure, uh, the, the simple difference is that when I'm doing distance to fault, I'm looking at reflections. So I'm transmitting a single frequency, I'm measuring the, how much energy bounces back at that frequency, and then I change the frequency and repeat, change the frequency and free, repeat. That's why we call it a sweep. So in other words, I'm sweeping the transmit frequency and measuring how much energy is bouncing back at the same frequency I'm transmitting at. So that's, that's, the, that's what DTF is using to collect the information to then predict, um, you know, take the frequency domain, convert it to time domain, and predict the locations of the, of the reflections. So distance to PIM is exactly the same math. However, the source of the information is coming from looking at the IM3 product as we're sweeping the transmit signals to cause the IM3 product to sweep. So we're looking at multiple frequency looks at the IM level, converting that to uh, time domain to then calculate the distances. So the simplest answer is one is based off of reflections and the other one is based off on inter interference created by the transmit signal. Okay, thank you. Uh, that appears to be about all the time we have. I want to apologize to anyone whose questions we did not get to. Uh, I want to thank Tom Bell, Senior Product Manager at Rinritsu, for presenting this Using Distance to PIM Technology to Speed Site Repairs webinar. Thank you.